Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan and today we're going to be talking about something that most Star Wars channels avoid like a play because it's something that completely delegitimizes almost every major space battle in the lore and that of course is orbital mechanics. In almost every space battle we see in the Star Wars galaxy, the way ships fly around, the way they make rapid turns and change directions at rapid speeds, it's always been theorized that this is designed to mimic kind of how real life dogfights happened, especially during World War II. It's said that George Lucas spent hours pouring through World War II gun cams for fighter pilots before he choreographed those famous dogfights over the Death Star. But here's the thing, airplanes fly in atmosphere. They must generate lift with their wings to fly, they encounter air resistance and also glide in the air. And most importantly, pilots have to fight gravity, the constant force beneath their feet that pulls their planes downwards. That is the beauty of these aerobatic knife fights. This is why we can romanticize death in the skies. Not only is there bullets and shrapnel flying around, the pilots are constantly struggling against the very forces of the earth to stay aloft like a bird in the sky. This is what makes these scenes feel so viscerally dangerous and exciting. But in space, in, in vacuum, uh, the pull of gravity is far less, and the way objects move is quite different. There's different mechanics at play. It's still extremely dangerous, but perhaps in a less visible way. Because first, when you're flying in vacuum, there's just a lack of reference objects around you. That's why doing 70 miles per hour on the FDR on the east side of Manhattan feels a lot faster than doing 120 miles through the desert from LA to Vegas. And one of the main reasons, um, as we mentioned in our last video, why flight is so slow in atmosphere is because of that air resistance. And when you're in vacuum, of course, that doesn't exist. This is why you can get to really, really fast speeds. For instance, the International Space Station is in low Earth orbit. While there is some atmosphere creating drag at these altitudes, the space station still travels at around 4.76 miles per second, which means around 17,400 miles per hour. And this is with very limited propulsion. It requires around just 25 to 50 pounds of thrust for this thing to stay in orbit. That's basically like a few backpack leaf blowers. If you listen closely, you can hear them outside the window. Which is amazing when you take a look at the specs on the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird, the high-altitude reconnaissance bird the US used to troll the North Koreans with. It could fly at Mach 3.2, or 2,193 miles per hour, but to reach the speed, it needs a thrust of 50,000 pounds, which comes from two Pratt & Whitney jet engines. So the SR-71 could fly at 1 8th the speed of the ISS, and it requires a thousand times more thrust to do this. Uh, it's a huge difference. This is the difference between being in orbit, low orbit, versus in atmosphere. I should also mention that the SR-71 faced a very specific set of limitations. Its operating ceiling of 85,000 feet is twice as high as your usual commercial liner. You know, at these altitudes, the air resistance is pretty limited, and actually the limiting factors of the SR-71's top speed is the engine's overheating and also just the strength of the internal structure. Yet at the same time, the SR-71 couldn't go any higher altitude where the air is even thinner because when the air gets too thin, the turbojets don't work. These things require oxygen for combustion. So why can the ISS fly with so little effort at such high speeds in low orbits? Well, this has a lot to do with orbital mechanics, which I honestly learned from this video game, Kerbal Space Program. Uh, the first version, the second version is pretty terrible. They abandoned it, I think. This is a game I really recommend to people who like to build things, like build vehicles and actually uh, see them fly. And it is quite educational and it's not that difficult to get into. And no, I'm not sponsored by this uh, video game, but I, I really do recommend it if you are interested in the subject matter in this video. So the SR-71 or any aircraft that is functioning in atmosphere is constantly fighting the gravitational attraction of the planets. This force constantly drags you to the center of the mass of the planet. And then along with the air Air resistance, these are the two things that you have to fight to stay aloft. But as this ancient Chinese man, Wen Hu, first found out, I'm just kidding, he exploded and died. If you travel fast enough, you can eventually reach what's known as escape velocity and escape the influence of gravity of that specific planet. Notice I say velocity and not distance, and that is because you need that velocity to generate force to counteract the gravitational pull's force. And while distance does affect the power of gravitational pull, we don't usually just spawn in vacuum, uh, kind of still in space, even though that's even a loaded term, you, you know, how are you actually still in space, like relative to what, right? So escape velocity is very relevant for what we're talking about here on Earth, and it requires a speed of close to 25,000 miles per hour to escape the Earth's gravity. Now that speed is only necessary if, um, wait. Okay, so 
Now that speed is only necessary, that 25,000 miles per hour, if you want to fly in a direct line away from the Earth. If you want to get into low orbits, a much lower speed like 17,000 miles is okay. That's actually the speed that the International Space Station is traveling at. This allows you to distance yourself away from the planet significantly without actually escaping. The ISS is about 250 miles above the surface of the planet, and at that range, gravity's pull isn't nearly as strong. Now, because you aren't traveling fast enough to just escape, and you're traveling fast enough to get outside of gravity's influence where it's not too strong, you basically start orbiting. Now, atmospheric drag on the ISS, as we mentioned, gradually brings it down like 90 meters a day. If it weren't for the thrust module on board giving it a small boost, you would eventually deorbit and crash. But basically, at this range, any kind of increase of speed basically increases your distance of your orbit, right? And any decrease brings you closer to the planet until, of course, you deorbit and crash. Now, because gravitational pull exists around all planetary bodies, you can even use other planets to slingshot you around, increasing your velocity at a very high rate. Thank you, Lando. It's like when you're in the playground as a kid and you're running around and you see the monkey bar platform. Like if you run at one of the poles that supports it and you swing your arm out and hold onto it as you're running by, it will swing you around and increase your trajectory quite a lot. It's the same principle. So there is a sweet spot when you're approaching a planet uh, that is calculated by speed and distance to the planet that will allow you to essentially use the force of the planet pulling you down to slingshot. Great move. So space battles in theory should heavily rely on orbital mechanics like this, which means that these battles happen at ridiculously fast speeds and even further ranges. You also have to pretty much calculate and plan your moves many steps hours, days ahead. I mean, take a look at the lunar missions. They were completely planned out and you generally don't want mid-mission deviations because everything from the fuel and oxygen is very carefully calculated. If you guys have seen the excellent first few seasons of The Expanse, the space battles there play out in a much more realistic manner than what we see in Star Wars, or does it? The idea of line of sight dogfights like we see during the Battle of Yavin is a bit perplexing and doesn't seem to make sense. It's something we would see in in-atmosphere battles during World War II, but not in space. But maybe that's because we're thinking about this through the very limited technology we have here on Earth. And so while there are a lot of much smarter people than me who will say that space battles in Star Wars are unrealistic, the one thing they don't have that I do is I'm a complete lore nerd. See, there are a few things in Star Wars combat that makes flight very different. Here on Earth, we have all sorts of propulsion methods that produce thrust, like turbojets or on the SR-71, or rockets on something like the Saturn V. In our world, escape velocity is the only way to really escape the gravity well of a planet and enter vacuum. But in Star Wars, things work differently. Remember when I said that we can't really just spawn in space completely still? Well, in Star Wars, you, you kind of can. And that's because of a piece of technology we talked about in our last video, the repulsor lift. So quick recap, repulsor lifts are essentially anti-gravity technology. This means instead of counteracting the force of gravity with thrust, they create a bubble around the craft that is not affected by gravity at all. This is purely in the realm of science fiction or even science fantasy. I mean, the only way we can create anti-gravity here on Earth is by jumping in an elevator. Uh, obviously. Otherwise, it really just is not possible. We won't even know where to start. Although I imagine putting a toaster inside of a microwave might get you started in the right direction. Although legally speaking, I, I can't recommend you guys do that. M maybe put a warning on screen, Congo, so we can you know cover all our bases here. Anyway, what does all of this mean? Well, repulsor lifts don't exactly make starfighters fly at very quick speeds. We took a look at a lot of starfighters in our last video, and most of these things are limited by air resistance and fly at around the speed of sound. And because starfighters don't use their main thrusters until they exit the atmosphere of a planet, in theory, these repulsor lift speeds shouldn't allow them to escape gravity because they're only traveling at like 800 miles per hour, which is far lower than escape velocity. But again, because this is anti-gravity technology, we don't really actually have to hit escape velocity because there is no force of gravity pulling you down it's completely negated by this magical energy so you can travel into space at a constant 800 miles per hour and that's perfectly fine at which point once you reach space then you can kick on the thrusters and fly much faster this is actually an extremely elegant and efficient solution to escaping gravity this also means that starfighters don't actually have to use orbital mechanics to fly around when battling above a planet they can indeed dogfights, aka change directions rapidly, which you really can't do when you're subjected to orbital mechanics because you're flying at such fast speeds. I mean, it just takes a long time to decelerate 
and accelerate. It should also be mentioned that there are inertial compensators on board of these starships which protect the pilots from g-forces, allowing these starfighters to perform otherwise deadly moves. Now of course there are some limitations to this repulsor lift technology, for instance it only functions within like 75,000 kilometers of a planet the size uh, or with the mass of Earth. So once you get outside of that bubble, uh, gravity kicks back in, I guess. And at that point, the repulsor lifts no longer work and you'll start getting pulled in by the planet and start free falling. Although the forces of gravity at 75,000 kilometers from the surface are considerably weaker at this point. So my conclusion is that actually Star Wars dogfights, especially the ones we see in low orbits, like in the gravity well of the Death Star or over Scarif or even Endor to a certain degree, could make sense because we're not dealing with spaceships like the ones we have in our own timeline that are you know relatively limited in technology and have to rely on orbital mechanics we're dealing with alien anti-gravity technology that allows starships to perform in a very spectacular way if anything my biggest complaint about star wars dogfights is not the fact that they're you know jinking around and flying around and maneuvering like they're in atmosphere it's that they don't do it quickly enough or abruptly enough if you take a look at these starfighters here, they're trying to strategically manage their energy, aka their aircraft speed and altitude, like a traditional dogfighter would, which makes no sense in vacuum, in, in a lack of gravity. Sometimes, especially with the X-Wings, you get a sense of air resistance in how they fly. You see how lift and drag is playing out on the starfighters, which again is unrealistic in vacuum. Well, actually, maybe the shield gate is low enough in orbit where gravity and air resistance does play on the airframe a little bit. The reality is, if these ships are actually powered by advanced ion or fusion thrusters and have anti-gravity technology, they should be moving around a lot more like that UFO sighting of that Tic Tac by that uh, Navy pilot in 2004. As in, uh, these TIE fighters should be not flying around like this, but it should be like, choo, 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 kind of like that, you know? Because you have the inertial compensator as well. Obviously, that might look kind of strange and alien to us on screen. You know, like I said before, there's something romantic about the earlier days of the Age of Flight. Seeing X-Wings glide, TIE fighters diving on their enemies is cool because it reminds us of those old gun cams from World War II. Now, ultimately, we do need to suspend disbelief when trying to enjoy what is entertainment, especially when it comes to Star Wars, where far more unbelievable things happen, like the lack of Jedi going to the dark side because they're using the Force to jerk off. I mean, if you think about it, after discovering that you can use the force you do a few cool things like telekinesis you know moving things around at which point you would just probably be directed towards doing what i like to call a force stranger anyway on that high note i want to see what you guys think about my theory here i for one after this thought exercise am surprised that star wars dogfights are actually far more realistic than we realize because of lore reasons as usual if you dig deep enough into the lore you can find explanations for almost anything Alright guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is the Republic to democracy. I'll see you next time.